Hello, we're still making progress in our uh, this year's National Pastors and Christian Leaders Conferences um, that is organized by the Challenge Enterprises of Ghana. But now I trust that you have followed us. You have, but if you are joining us for the first time, hey, that's fine and you're welcome because this is what um, we are in for. And um, this year the conference is addressing the general theme God's faithfulness in the midst of evil and uh, pandemic. And um, today we have a, a special person doing the presentation for us. He is in the person of Reverend Professor J. Kwabna Asamwa Jedu. Um, Professor Asamwa Jedu is the president of Trinity Theological Seminary, Legon. He's also a minister with the Methodist Church, Ghana. Prof is uh, uh, the Baita Grau Professor of Contemporary African Christianity and Pentecostal and Charismatic Theology. He has authored several books, including um, the one we are, uh, we've been introducing to you, and this is his very latest, based on the current happening, Christianity and faith in the COVID-19 era. How appropriate that is to our theme. We trust that you will be blessed. Prof is married to Theodora, and um, they have three children. He specifically will be addressing this book, Christianity and Faith in the COVID-19 Era. So, don't go away. Prof is ready to be used by God to be a blessing to you. Welcome, Professor J. Kwabna Asamwajedu. This is a, a conference on which I have had the privilege of uh, speaking at uh, many times, but even before I, I started as a speaker, I had the privilege of being a participant. And I have uh, many books on my shelf uh, that come from this conference. I hope that when you get the books, you read them because they have uh, really been a blessing. I still speak very fondly of my first conference at the Cabo Methodist Church, I think around 82 or thereabouts. And um, that's when I first encountered uh, my book, Budek and his books on spiritual warfare. I still have the Thompson Chase Re Chain Reference Bible that I was given uh, at that conference. And one of the books from that conference I attended, the first one uh, that I attended in 1982, uh, was a book on Nehemiah. And interestingly, just last year I had to preach a series of sermons on Nehemiah. And a lot of material came from my encounter with that book. So, if you are participating in this conference, it's a very good conference. As far as I am aware, it's the only uh, pastors and Christian leaders conference that comes with a set of books. And so I will encourage you not only to benefit from what we share with you, but also to make time to spend money on some books to enrich your library, but most importantly, your ministry. Now, the topic that I have been assigned uh, relates to the broader topic that is displayed behind me, God's faithfulness in the midst of evil and the pandemic. And I'm speaking in particular to the topic of sanity and faith in the pandemic era. This is actually the title of the book that will come in the collection. Uh, I told myself during the lockdown period that I shouldn't get out of this lockdown without knowing what I have done with the time because I do complain a lot that I, that I just go around the place a bit busy traveling, speaking, writing, teaching, managing the affairs of the seminary. So if the Lord has given me time, it's not a good time in terms of what we're going through, but at least there was time at our disposal. Uh, each one of us, not just me, each one of us must be able to say what you have done the time that God has given me. So I spent part of the time writing this book called Christianity and Faith in the Pandemic Era. And I'm happy that challenge is going to make it available to you. The subtitle that I'm dealing with 
is lockdown periods from feet washing to Pentecost. So Christianity and faith in the pandemic era, lockdown periods from feet washing to Pentecost. Not many of you who are listening to us and watching us will be aware that in this past century, at the beginning of the 20th century, we had a major pandemic, the influenza pandemic that affected the whole world. The statistics available uh, tells us that a lot of people died, 50 million people died. Particularly in the non-Western context of Africa, Asia, and Latin America, a lot of Indians died, and also in Europe. And this was around 1918. I don't know whether this is something that God is telling us, but it's interesting that at the beginning of the 21st century, we have another pandemic. In between, there have been others like the HIV and the Ebola. But as everybody is saying, this one looks a bit different. But if you think it's different, go back and read about the influenza pandemic. The reason why I begin with the influenza pandemic of 1918, 1919, is that the Christian world, especially in Africa, made a religious response. In fact, it was at the outbreak of that pandemic that we had the emergence of what we call the African Independent Church Movement. Some people will call it the Alagura Movement. Some of these movements in Ghana and Nigeria started because ordinary African Christians rallied when the white man's medicine proved ineffective against the influenza, they rallied and prayed. And God, in the power of His Spirit, descended. So we trace the solution, part of the solution to the influenza pandemic, to the prayers that were offered by ordinary Africans. Some of them did not even have formal education. And a lot of the independent churches emerged around that time. This was the period just before this powerful prophet called William Wadi Harris had passed through our land from Liberia, made many comments. This was a man who was able to call fire down to burn shrines around the western region and see half a state area. They used to be places of the stronghold of traditional deities. And it was around the spirit that the pandemic, the influenza pandemic broke. See, when people were dying, Christians came together to pray. So it's a challenge. The times in which we find ourselves are times of evil. But we want to prove that our God is a good God who can reverse evil. Jesus says, I came that you may have life and have life in its fullness. If we are a Christian leader, a pastor, or even an ordinary Christian, let's be aware that not only are we in challenging times, but this is a call upon us to demonstrate pastoral care in a different way. We have, through the raising of tithes and offerings, collected money from church members, they have blessed the church. This is a time to ask, what can we give? The ordinary church members who have lost their jobs and who are struggling. So, what I'm calling for is a reinvention, a new understanding of care. The COVID 19 pandemic has forced the world to face what I will call one of the most enigmatic phenomena in human life, and that's the reality of evil and suffering. We don't preach that if people give their tithes and offerings and if they pray, things will go well. That's what we all pray for. 
We are a church as pastors and Christian leaders to encourage people. I don't preach. Uh, I don't preach a gospel of poverty. I preach a gospel of prosperity. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is a gospel of prosperity. What I discourage is that we should stop preaching a gospel of materialism. Prosperity is good, but materialism is an obstacle to the kingdom. And this kind of message we preach, sometimes we forget that life sometimes comes with the value of the shadow of death. We have people who have lost their jobs, who have lost their businesses, who have lost their money, and fortunes have declined. How do you respond as a Christian leader or a pastor to your members, to the world in times of evil? So this development concerns all of us because leadership is about providing hope in times of despair. Anyone can perhaps provide some form of leadership when things are normal and the ship is steady. It is when the storms begin to rock the boat, as happened in the time of Jesus, that leadership is called upon to prove its mettle. When things are going well, easier to provide leadership. As a pastor, you can preach all that you want to preach when things are all right and when everybody is succeeding. But what do you say to people in times of evil? My dear friends, nobody prays for it, but evil is part of our lives. There are many sources of evil in the world. From a biblical point of, of view, evil comes ultimately from Satan. And we see how he invaded the Garden of Eden through the serpent and destroyed virtually what God had created. In 1 Peter 5, verse 8, we are told that he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. The Bible says these things. We don't have to take them easy. Because if there were no evil in the world, Jesus would not have inserted in the Lord's prayer the lion deliver us from evil. As we rejoice the good and abundance, we should also be aware that there is an enemy who prowls around like a royal lion. So certainly, the Bible provides examples in which plagues and pestilences are sent by God as punishment for human sin. So there is the one that is caused by Satan, but God can also bring pestilence. We know this from the experience of Egypt and the plagues. One of the classic examples of this then is the place that Egypt had to endure when Pharaoh refused to release Israel from bondage. In the case of Job, for example, evil came as a test of faith in the sovereignty of God. But there is also moral evil. The simple choices we make can bring evil in the world. If you take the case of Adam and Eve, they made a choice. The point is, the way we deploy our senses can be a conduct for evil in the world. And as Christian leaders, we've got to be aware of that. If you look carefully at the way the serpent tempted Eve, the serpent came through the senses. The serpent first went to Eve and asked her a question. Did God tell you not to eat of this fruit? The first sense that was compromised was the sense of hearing. Eve had no business listening to a serpent an animal that she was supposed to exercise dominion over. But she made a sense of hearing available. For some of us as Christian leaders, that which is causing our downfall and breaking fresh is because we like listening to gossip. 
Mbona tuluo huwa pastor A au pastor B au elder A au elder B has said about me. You compromise your sense of hearing. Then you compromise your sense of speaking. Because when you hear, you act. So if he was told and she listened to some a bee that she was not supposed to listen to, the next thing that happened is that a sense of sight was compromised because we are told that she looked and saw that it was good for food. Before you see that it is good, the word good there refers to the sense of smell. So her hearing was compromised, her sight was compromised, her sense of smell was compromised. And the rest of it, the Bible says she took as a sense of touch and she ate the sense of taste. You compromise one and the rest are all gone. So evil can come through the choices we make. I recall uh, a young pastor who had been suspended uh, came to see me because she had, he had fallen through some morals. And then I listened to his story very carefully. In the narrative, I never heard one sentence about what role he himself played in the troubles. And the church doesn't like me, and the leader doesn't like me, and so on. So after he had narrated the story which took more than 30 minutes, I asked my simple question. I agree, the leader of your denomination does not like you. All the people are jealous of him, I agree. He said the leader. Who also paid for the hotel where you took that young lady was sitting there looking at me. So the choices we make can bring evil. And I am, I wouldn't be surprised if this coronavirus, in part, I'm not a scientist, but I suspect that in part. It may have come from the irresponsible ways in which we have misused the environment. We have so abused the good, natural environment that God has given us that very soon we will pay a heavier price if we don't take it than we are paying now. In our own country, we feel that we must put rubbish anywhere and put concrete everywhere. Just about 20 years ago, I used to travel a lot on the Eburi Mountains, going to an institution there called Akubi Crystal Institute. I still go there, but I remember more than 20 years ago when the institution started, when you were climbing the Eburi Hills, the green that you see and the serenity of the environment. Try and climb it today and see. We pour concrete everywhere when we have money. We think that we can destroy everything. So evil comes in various ways. Nobody prays for it, but it comes. The Bible accounts for all these things of evil and presents evil as that which opposes the good. So evil is anything that opposes that which is good and ultimately evil inflicts suffering. In the case of Adam and Eve, it led to alienation from God. In the case of Pharaoh and the Egyptians, people died. In the case of David, he fell into this moral sin. In the case of Nehemiah, he had to stand and vigilant against Sanbala and Tobiah. Because sometimes evil can come through other people. It can come through your child, your home, your wife, your husband can be a source of evil in the home. One of the contemporary um, evangelical leaders, he is the same tradition as the late John Stott. His name is Christopher Wright. Christopher Wright correctly knows that all of us struggle to make sense of the presence of evil in the midst of God's own creation. The coronavirus crisis has disrupted church life and become for many Christians a classic example of the enigma of evil against the reality of a compassionate God. How do we as Christian leaders and pastors 
make biblical sense, make theological sense of the evil in the pandemic era as the world and the church struggles to provide a sort of prayerful leadership in times like this. The prayerful leadership that is needed in times like this. Businesses have gone down. Domestic incomes have taken a hit. We have constantly assured believers that when they fulfill all their financial obligations towards the church, God will fulfill the side of the bargain with immeasurable blessings. All that is right. Now we are all forced to ask the critical question where is our God? And like Jesus on the cross, we are crying, My God, my God. Why have you forsaken us? It was at the height of the COVID-19 pandemic that the church had to celebrate some of its most important events. The foot washing and the establishment of the Last Supper, the crucifixion on the following day, the resurrection, the ascension and Pentecost. In the year 2020, all these major Christian celebrations were done under either lockdown or restrictions. In non-Western countries, like the ones we live in Africa, events like this attract many to church, and this would have been, if you like, a ripple season in terms of resources, because we love to be in church. We celebrate with public processions, reenacting in joyful tones the march to Golgotha, the tomb, the Mount of Ascension, and crown it all with the coming of the, of the Spirit in Pentecost. These days, many churches follow the celebrations of the Hosanna event with feet washing, and there's feet washing in churches, and communion in the evening of Good Friday. We were denied all of this by this virus in the presence of which even the military might of America is proving ineffectual. The outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic meant that the Christian seasons that were celebrated joyfully and now had to be done in lockdown mode. This was strange. But that was the same context in which our faith was born. The Christian faith itself emerged out of the groans for the release from evil. The biblical history of the Christian faith shows that lockdown periods offer opportunities to reflect on the painful origins of our faith as the powers of evil resisted the might of the sovereign God. When Jesus met his disciples in lockdown mode, and when he took that bowl of water and the towel and washed their feet, he was teaching them a lesson on leadership behind closed doors, lockdown mode. And these are the issues that we need to read. This God is telling us that there is, there is, there is, this is a time for us to re reflect on the world of leadership that as pastors we are providing for this country and for our churches and for our members. It's a time to rethink. Because Jesus told them, you call me teacher and Lord and I have washed your feet, washed one another's feet. Today, Christian leaders want to be treated by chief executive officers and be carried on the shoulders of church workers. COVID-19 has given us an opportunity to rethink the path that we have chosen. So in the light of the biblical meanings of these celebrations, my question is what are the theological lessons on evil and suffering that we can learn from this pandemic? If I may quote Christopher Wright again, 
We who believe in God and know and trust Him find ourselves torn apart. And the church must provide leadership. During the 2020 Passion Week, the week of the crucifixion, starting from the Hosanna, the triumphant entry, CNN showed pictures of the original Passover context in lockdown mode. Jerusalem was in lockdown mode. The streets of Jerusalem were empty, shops were closed, and people stayed home. For the first time in living memory, Passover was celebrated behind closed doors. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic that kept most people locked down and confined, God's word to Israel in bondage. When I see the blood I will pass by, came in handy in the 2020 Passion Week. The original episode occurred in terrifying times as Yahweh inflicted place to soften Pharaoh's heart. That it took the death of male firstborns, including those of animals, for Pharaoh to release Israel from bondage tells much about the terrorizing effect of the drought around the first Passover, which we now celebrate as the resurrection. The Passover lamb is now the lamb of God, Jesus, who takes away the son of the world. But the original Passover was celebrated in lockdown. The first crucifixion, only a few disciples had the courage to follow Jesus to Golgotha. The rest ran away to hide. They were in lockdown. People often wonder why Pharaoh is blamed for his transients. If indeed it was the Lord who hardened his heart, as the writer of Exodus indicates. Reading the text, it would seem unthinkable that the resolve of a human being could be so strong that in the face of such suffering, he, he was still persist in keeping this dry in bondage. But that's what happens when human beings insist on going against God's will. He leaves them to their devices. We create the atmosphere for evil to thrive and the resultant pain and suffering affects everyone as in Pharaoh's day. I remember that the outbreak of this pandemic at the beginning were all making part of China. People circulated videos on social media showing the kind of reptiles that Chinese eat and claiming that the pandemic has come as a result of these things that Chinese eat. We didn't hear this, but it was descending our way. Even Donald Trump referred to the uh, COVID 19 pandemic as the China virus. Today, his country is the most affected. Dear pastors and recent leaders, evil can be persistent and enigmatic. Today, the season that was celebrated under, under lockdown, we refer to it as Good Friday. The adjective good was added to that Friday years later because the passion of the Christ was such an agonizing experience. And at some point, the sweat of Jesus took the form of blood. The original day of the passion was one of pain and sorrow. This was evident, even in the way the Last Supper was celebrated, as Jesus walked the feet of his disciples and took the opportunity to trample lessons of the new paradigm of humble leadership that he was laying down for them. The followers of Jesus had to run for their lives and take cover when he was arrested. When on the cross, Jesus cried, My God, my God, how have you forsaken me? He was quoting words from Psalm, Psalm 22. And this was indicative of the fulfillment of scripture as far as the crucifixion was concerned. God was in action, even in the time of evil. 
The onslaught of evil continued through the morning of the resurrection. When Jesus himself appeared to the disciples and breathed on them the Holy Spirit, they were still in lockdown mode. They were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jews. When Jesus stood among them and said, Peace be with you. John chapter 20 and verse 19. Thus, the first Easter, the one we celebrate in White Cross today, was celebrated with the disciples locked down. When the two disciples on the road to Emmaus returned to deliver the good news of their encounter with Christ, the others were still in lockdown mode. Things changed when they testified that Jesus had not only revealed himself to see, but also to several others. The resurrection broke the back of evil by turning the cross, originally a symbol of curse or shame, into a symbol of glory. My point is that evil will never have the last word. And so it's important that as Christian leaders, we see the sovereignty of God in the valley of the shadow of death. It is a time to bring a new word to God's people. The truth of the resurrection is that God cannot be locked down. Peter testified to this on the day of Pentecost when he said of Jesus in Acts 2 24, but God raised him up, having freed him from death because it was impossible for him to be held in its power. So it was impossible for death to hold Jesus in its power. The resurrection was not simply a triumph over the enemies of the gospel. It was also a total destruction of their evil plans against the Son of God and the salvific destinies of humanity. In the resurrection, God moved out of lockdown mode in that cemetery and held the question to the women at the tomb. Why do you search for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The grave was locked down. The resurrection was released. And God is going to release us from this lockdown that we might serve Him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. From that point, it was clear that our evidence of the power of the resurrection of Christ ought to consist in people witnessing in our own lives and in the church, the active power of the Spirit. Those of you who like to point to the grave, the empty grave of Jesus, as a sign of the resurrection, you have to change your mindset. My mother died only about 40 years ago. We can't find the grave. I don't think that the grave I saw in Jerusalem was the actual grave of Jesus. I'll give you my reason. Those of you who were old enough, I was in class one, but those of you who were old enough when Kuma was on the see how his effigy was bent and everything. In those days, my father tells me, if you had books on your Kuma, you had to bend. The Jewish ladies would not have stood by for the grave of Jesus to be turned into a pilgrimage site and would have destroyed it. That is the reason why America buried the Sabbath and died in this, so that his followers don't do a day homage. When you go to Jerusalem, respect the grave as a symbol that Jesus rose again. But the actual evidence for the resurrection does not lie in an empty grave, it lies in your life as a Christian leader. That's why Jesus told Thomas. Blessed are those who did not see and yet believe. John Pilate is also an evangelical Christian author. In fact, he wrote the first book on coronavirus. It's titled Coronavirus and Christ. And he wrote this in April, just a month after the coronavirus outbreak. He says, and he put this very succinctly within the context of the coronavirus pandemic, when he writes that. 
the ultimate aim of God for his people is that we glorify his greatness and magnify the work of the Son Jesus Christ. And the work of the Son Jesus Christ might be found in your life and in my life, not in an empty grave. That is the work of the Spirit in human life. At Jesus' ascension, the disciples were so confused that they needed an angelic assurance. So Acts chapter 1 verse 11, does Jesus, who has been taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven? The moon is made clear by the fact that immediately after the ascension, the disciples placed themselves in lockdown mode as they waited for the empowering presence of the Spirit. I want to believe that in this period of lockdown restrictions, your own prayer life has changed. For as Peter told the crowd on the day of Pentecost, the Jesus who was crucified was the same one that God raised up. And being therefore exalted in the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he has poured out those that we will see and hear. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. So on the day of Pentecost, the disciples were in lockdown in anticipation of being clothed with power, and God did not disappoint as we read in Acts 2. The two celebrations, Ascension and Pentecost, are therefore related because Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 8, that when he ascended to heaven, he poured gifts unto men. In this journey, from the feet washing to the crucifixion to Pentecost, we learn that ultimately the resolve of evil could not withstand the might of the Almighty God. Evil will seem to thrive in some circumstances, but it never has the last word as far as God is concerned. And the COVID-19 pandemic is never going to have the last word. This world is God's will, and we are His people. The people we meet are looking for a word of assurance from us. We learn from biblical salvation history that evil can have a terrifying effect as we see how the disciples were kept in lockdown throughout the day of the resurrection. It is striking that the same qualities that the Passover lamb was supposed to possess in Exodus were also ascribed to Jesus Christ. Christ is our Passover lamb. He is described in words chosen from Exodus as one whose blood is precious. A lamb without blemish or defect, and who was chosen before the creation of the world, and who has been revealed in our time. First Peter 1 19 to 20. So, in the midst of pain, we need to look out for the purposes of God, and for the lockdown periods, we realize the following that number one, in the midst of the valley of the shadow of death, God remains sovereign. Two, that the might of the most powerful in the world could come unstuck in times of crisis. And we see how, as I have already said, America with all its might is struggling for answers. The gospel we preach ought to account for the fact that sometimes the system of the world can fail, no matter how strong they appear to be. Number four, the church must provide leadership. The church must provide leadership and tell us how we are going to recover. So we are calling for a new message. And we must remember that the end times are real. We may have different views on why the world was affected with COVID 19. Many theories abound, ranging from conspiracy theories to the pandemic being a punishment from God against human sin and rebellion. Whatever the reason, God has lessons to teach His church in the time of evil, suffering, and pain. Through it, we are called to ponder our relationship with Him. 
And as Joel invites us to do, rend your heart and not your garments. Thus Christ, John Piper notes, invite us to make God the all-important pervasive reality in our lives. In God's salvation history, lockdown mode is never a permanent condition because he never has the last word as long as he waits. God bless you and I trust that as we move out of these restrictions, the mode of Christian leadership will change and we will anchor our leadership styles in the scriptures, knowing that our faith Feet washing and pentacles, God has not done with his head, but God has something to teach us out of these instructions. God bless you. Once again, this is where we draw the curtains for today's edition of the Pastors and um, Christian Leaders Conferences um, that is organized by the Challenge Enterprises of Ghana. You just heard um, Professor Jay Kwabna Asamwajedu in that wonderful presentation. And like we said, um, that is based on his book um, that carries the very title or the very topic he treated. But then we also have um, a set of books like, like, we, do, like we do with all the national um, pastors and uh, Christian leaders conferences. You have a set of books that have been highly subsidized. So you can access this online and um, you will have your copies. You can follow the, the addresses that are on the screen and you can avail, I mean, uh, access some of these materials. Uh, we trust that this whole conference has been a wonderful blessing to you from the comfort of your homes. And so uh, we pray that the information received will blossom and yield and bear fruits in your life. Until we meet you again, God richly bless you.